when I was growing up as a young boy in, in gospel music, um, most of the hymn singing on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, um, and when I traveled in, uh, uh, as a bass guitarist and a pianist uh, for quartets, uh, I would say seven out of ten songs were about the second coming. Seven out of ten songs were about the second coming. You could literally open the hymn book, and it, and it really looked like that those who decided what songs would be put in there, they just, it was just a massive section on the second coming. One of those songs, most famous songs, one of the most famous songs was written by Robert Winsett. He was born in Bledsoe County, Tennessee, and graduated from the Bowman Norman School of Music in 1899. He went on to be a, a composer, wrote hundreds and hundreds of songs, and in 1923, he became affiliated with the Church of God and became a minister. One of those songs to this day is one of, still one of the most famous songs uh, in the uh, in the Pentecostal Baptist movement, and uh, I used to play this on the piano, play it on the guitar, play it on the bass. We used to sing bass in this song, and the song was called "Jesus Is Coming Soon." And uh, if you want to watch a funny version of it, YouTube Oak Ridge Boys, "Jesus Is Coming Soon." They're a riot, anyway. Troublesome times are here. Filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear now is at stake. Humble your hearts to God, saves from the chastening rod. Seek the way pilgrims trod, Christians away. And here's the chorus. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All of the dead in Christ, righteous meet in the sky. Going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Top favorite. I can still <clears throat> see my dad just up there, mom leading the choir. I'm on the piano. And it's just, I love the song. I really do. And I'm going to show you why. Um, let's ask a question. Why did Pastor Winsett, music composer, music writer, Combine in one event, many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. In one event, when the trumpet sounds, many will meet their doom. And he believed that. I looked it up. He was Church of God. <laughs> he wasn't a Baptist. <laughs> he believed that when Jesus comes again, when the trumpets sound, both judgment and safety will happen. Judgment to the lost, safety to God's people at the trumpet sound. I'll come back to this in a moment. I'm building on what we did last week and getting, if you weren't here last week, I'll get you up to speed really fast and then we're going to add to it. The Bible uses what, is, what theologians call prophetic foreshortening. It means the Bible talks about things that's going to happen in the future for in advance, but those events are future and they're compressed they're compressed, foreshortening. When the prophets looked down through time, they did not fully, I'll say this, fully realize that there was a long expanse of time from his first advent to his second advent. In fact, from their vantage point, it appeared that there was no distance at all. When the Messiah comes, he will set up his kingdom and rule over the nations with a rod of iron. What the prophet saw was like a, like a mountain peak in the distance. What they often did not see was that there was another mountain peak behind the first mountain peak. But from their front porch view, all they could see was one mountain peak, not two. Look at Isaiah in your sermon outline. I'll give you an example of this. This is all over the Old Testament. But here's a good one. Look at prophetic foreshortening of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 5 through 7. I'll show it to you. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The crucifixion. 
the birth and the crucifixion. For to us a child is born, and 33 years from that mountain peak to the next one, to us a son is given. But it looks like it's happening really fast. It's compressed future events, looking like they're happening really, really quick, or all at once, but they're not. Now look at the next one. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And that latter part, that mountain peak, is almost 2,000 years away from the last one when the son was given on the cross. But here it is wrapped up in three verses, and it seems like it's just all going to happen at once. But it's not. There's time in this one here. There's lots of time in between to us a son is given and sitting on the throne of David to implement justice over all the earth. And when you think about it now, we don't feel so sorry for the disciples for being clueless. And you know, it's no wonder that uh, the Apostle Peter in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says that uh, the Christ is going to be crucified and on the third day rise again. And Peter pulls him aside and, and rebukes Jesus for talking such nonsense. What in the world are you talking about? And Jesus responds, get behind me, Satan, for you do not have the things of God in mind. It explains even furthermore that Peter, we find him in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he pulls his dagger out and starts to rumble. He believes that it's, it's time. The kingdom is, this, this is it. King Jesus is going to sit on the throne of his father David and rule and reign, and Rome is done. He's ready to go. And Jesus says, put that back. That's not how my kingdom comes. What? This is how all God's people dealt with the heathen. Jesus, have you never read Joshua? <laughs> it explains even furthermore, and maybe even Peter was the spokesperson at this event. Acts chapter 1. Christ has been crucified, buried, risen, seen by many witnesses, and he's about to ascend to his father. And they ask him in Acts chapter 1, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? Is it, is it, is it now? Is it right now? It's not for you to know the times and the seasons which God has ordained. But I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, and I want you to move out to the nations spreading the gospel. And maybe even then they only thought that, well, maybe just a, this is just, you know, maybe just a, maybe this year. What they did not see was the expanse of time between his first advent and his second, or even that there would be two advents. But there is. In his first advent, he came lowly in a manger, born of a virgin, born of the Holy Spirit, completely dependent upon others to take care of him. He lived his life mostly in secrecy, hiding his true identity from everyone. Around the age of 30, he submits to water baptism by the hands of John the Baptist, lived the sinless life by the power of the Holy Spirit, was crucified, buried, rose again on the third day, was seen by many witnesses, ascended to his father's throne, and when he advents again, he will fulfill all the promises given through the prophets. He will rule and reign on earth forever with all those who have loved and longed for his appearing, his second parousia, his second adventus. And that's where we are right now in redemptive history. Last week, uh, we were spent a lot of time in Matthew chapter 24 and, and Luke 17. Let me just give you a brief uh, outline of that. Remembering the timing of the trumpets. For you must endure to the end, not the beginning of the end. And that's a very important word to Jesus because he uses it several times. 
It's the Greek word telos, which we get our English word telescope. You must endure all the way to the very end of what I'm aiming at. Not the beginning of the end, but you've got to go all the way to the end in order to be saved. He speaks of birth pains are going to increase more and more and more as birth pains do increase as the time approaches for the birth of a baby. It'll get harder and sharper. Will increase as the day draws near of his second advent. He speaks of persecution of the saints will increase. We see that as well. Persecution of the saints. There will come a time on planet Earth that there will be no safe place to be a Christian and openly hold this in public. Just like it is in many countries today already. It will be dangerous to be a Christian in America. He speaks of a world-renowned man or a kingdom of man will enthrone himself over all the world. And then, at the end of the tribulation in Matthew 24, the trumpet sound. It comes at the end of the tribulation, not at the beginning of the end. And like the days of Noah and Lot, the lost are taken, they're swept away into judgment. While the people of God, people of God are left behind, like Noah and his family, and Lot and Abraham, they were left behind, that is, left out of the judgment. You want to be left out of the judgment. You don't want to be taken into judgment when the trumpet sounds. And then we looked at Matthew chapter 25, which is Jesus' application, and he uses three parables. The whole chapter has got three parables in it. Last week, this is actually where we ended. Get ready. He speaks of being wise in your watching. Be wise in how you watch what's happening. He gave us many things to be on the lookout for, specific things. In the next parable, be faithful with what you have. Own what you have. The Lord has supplied you with talents and spiritual gifts. He's given you a certain level of income. He's given you a certain level of education. He's given you a certain place and a lot in life. Be faithful with what you have. God will take care of the results. Just be faithful. Be faithful. So this is what it means to be ready. And when he returns, finally, he gives one more parable. Be serving the neediest among us. Be serving. Be serving others. Looking out for the needs of others and caring for others. And then we left off last week with the promise, as Matthew ends the gospel narrative, I will be with you to the end of the age. Not the beginning of the end, but to the end. All the way to the end. So what I want to do today is I want to drop in, as if we were still speaking from last Sunday, where we are, I'm going to drop in three more passages, and then we're going to go to Paul the Apostle and look at where you find the most usage of the Greek word parousia, or Jerome's Latin Vulgate, Adventus, and look at what the Apostle Paul has to say about trumpets and about Christ's second advent. First of all, 1 Corinthians 15 Verses 51 and 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the what? Trumpet. Uh, he could have said brass. He could have said uh, gray or brown or black. Or if it's last, he, he, I post, he said, could have said Implication: uh, The first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, I don't know. But he did say last, and this is not a throwaway word. The Holy Spirit just doesn't drop adjectives in for nothing. <laughs> it's there for a reason. At the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Keeping that in mind, when we turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 11... all the way through the tribulation period. And there's seven trumpets. I see this as, as Paul's way of saying the last trumpet. And it is at the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet, that the redeemed are finally with the Lord, and at the same time, the wicked are judged. So back to 
uh, this song, Jesus is Coming Soon, many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound, and this is the text where he got it. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. See, it's done. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged. So this is the seventh trumpet, blowing the trumpet, and this is what's happening. The wrath has come. Christ is now reigning. And for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. So both rejoicing around the throne of God, God's people are rescued, they're safe and sound, and the wicked are being destroyed. And it's the seventh trumpet. It's the 1 Corinthians 15 last trumpet. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and earthquake and heavy hail. And that little refrain right there about the lightning and rumblings and so forth is what John puts at the end of the bowls because it's done. Now he's going to tell you the picture again. Same scene, just a little bit more different information through the trumpets. And then the trumpets are done like that. Here it is. It's the crescendo. It's the finale. And then he's going to tell the story again with the bowls and uses the same finale refrain. Well, uh, this just isn't in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament. Joshua chapter 6. On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. So what happened? At the last trumpet, the sounding of the seventh trumpet on the seventh day was the time for victory. And God's people went over the walls, the walls fell down, the people were devoted to destruction, and God's people were finally safe in their land that God promised. And that parallels with exactly Matthew chapter 24. The trumpet comes at the end of the tribulation, not at the beginning of the end. It parallels Luke 17. It parallels 1 Corinthians 15. At the last trumpet, it parallels Revelation chapter 11. It's all telling the same story. So I do believe and I agree with pastor songwriter Robert Winsett that at Christ's second advent, two things will happen at the same time. The lost will be taken into judgment, and the redeemed will be left out of that judgment at the sound of the last or the seventh trumpet. So the Greek word, parousia, from which we get adventus in Latin, is not only found from the lips of Jesus in the gospel narratives, it's found in Paul's writings to the church, preeminently to the church of Thessalonica. So if you'll turn to 1 Thessalonians with me. And we are now back in the area of get ready. He's coming back. Get ready. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Keeping in mind, this church was uniquely... Um, bombarded with a false teaching that the day of the Lord had already come. The day of the Lord is synonymous with his second advent. It means the same thing. That it, he had already come and these poor believers were left out. And some had gotten to the point where they just sat around and didn't do anything. And uh, Paul, Paul reminds them of what he already spoke to them, brings them back to the truth that Christ has not brought his second advent. Not yet. And you should be aware of that because you can be aware of it. You can actually know when it's about to happen, just like I remember uh, our children being born at Rush Copley. Uh, no, not Rush Copley. The grandchildren at Rush Copley. Uh, children in Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, and uh, St. Louis. Whoops. Anyway, um, uh, you don't know the day or the hour that, that this 
birth is going to take place. But you know it's soon. You know it's soon. And Paul wants to help the believers to understand, listen, this thing isn't going to happen just out of nowhere and you just be totally caught off guard. There's going to be plenty that you're going to see. So get ready, get ready, get ready. So let's work on this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. And this is like a benediction here in the middle of this letter. 1 Thessalonians 3, 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you in for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the parousia, at the adventus of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. This uh, benediction right here uh, of what it means to get ready. What does it mean to get ready? Well, according to this benediction, we could say, number one, let us abound in love for one another, Grace Community Church. It, right there it is. Let's keep loving one another. It is critical that the church remains loving one another until the day of his second advent. We love one another. We love one another so that we can be found blameless in holy conduct. So we should pray about this, think about this. As the week goes along, it's Advent season. Lord, would you help me uh, be, be mindful of loving my church family? May I pray today? May I send a card, phone call, a text? Uh, Lord, help me love my church family. That's what it means to get ready. Sounds simple, but it's part of what it means for the church to be ready for Christ's second Advent. Let's keep loving one another. And all that that means. We could go further. Chapter 4, verse 9. Now concerning brotherly love, so he picks it back up. You have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. That's code language for those who have died in the Lord. That's not a passage to drum up a false teaching of soul sleep. No, those who are absent from the body are present with the Lord. It's just a soft way of saying he died and he knew the Lord. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do, who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, the parousia, the Adventists, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. It's the same trumpet in Joshua, the same trumpet in Matthew, the same trumpet in Luke, the same trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15, the same trumpet in Revelation chapter 11, that every single one of them happened at the end, not the beginning of the end. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So we can say a, a few more things now what it means to be ready. Secondly, we have a sure hope that we will meet again those who have died in the Lord. Marsha, I can't wait to see your mom again. I can't wait. I can't wait to see my dad. I can't wait to see Aunt Sharon. And I can go on and on.
And therefore, encourage one another with these words. What does it mean to be ready? Love one another. Secondly, to have a sure hope that I'm going to be reunited with those who have died in the Lord. One day we get to sit down and have conversations with Rahab, Esther, Mary, Lydia, Paul, Isaiah, people who have gone on before throughout world history, missionaries, get to sit down and really ask Jim Elliott, what was it like to have a spear punched through you on that sandbar? Wycliffe, what was it like to feel the heat of that flame for translating the Bible into English? I probably won't ask those questions. But we get to meet. We get to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what it means to encourage one another with these words. Sometimes we just simply need to be reminded, folks, and tell one another, you'll be with the Lord one day. Love one another. You'll see your mom again. You'll see your dad again in the Lord, of course. And I have one passage for all of us in here that I've been asked, and it's one of the scariest verses, or one of the scariest questions I've ever been asked as a pastor. Ivan, how am I supposed to be happy in this life, and how in the world can I be happy in the next life, knowing that my fill-in-the-blank father, mother, child, whatever, died without the Lord? Heaven can't be heaven if I had that knowledge. And here's my reply. I don't understand it. And it goes for me as well. This feeling that I can't be happy. One day, according to Revelation chapter 18, this is the only verse I got to hang my hat on on this question. I know that in the sweet by and by, I'm going to really say, because I'm going to believe it and see it with all my heart, just and true are all your ways, King of heaven and earth. Just and true are all your ways. And somehow, some way, we'll be led in sweet fellowship and joy forever and evermore. I'm just going to believe it. I hope you will too. I hope you believe that your God is powerful enough and great enough that he's got a sweet by and by for you no matter what. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We should have conversations, and I've thought about this. Um, I'm just going to say it. Um, there came a point in my walk with the Lord that I got sick and tired of eschatology, the study of end times. I did. I, just, I, got, I, I grew up in it. It was around me all the time. It seemed like every song, seemed like every sermon, including my dad. Um, went off to Bible college. Man, that's all they sing down here, too. That's all they talk about. And I'm just tired of this. There's got to be more to Christian living than just talking about him coming back. And uh, so I just, in, I actually intentionally avoided eschatology, study of end times. I quit reading the book of Revelation. I quit reading passages in Thessalonians. I quit reading Matthew 24. I quit reading anything that had to do with Jesus coming back. Because I just got, I got tired of it. And I wanted, I wanted someone to spend time with me and teach. And let's sing about what it means to live for Jesus now. What's it mean to live my life now? I need help right now. All right, he's coming back, fine. But I got to live my life right now. And I, there's where I, I wanted to focus on that. And I did for a long time. I go off to seminary. And these... These knucklehead rich Presbyterians found out how much eschatology I know. And they dared me to challenge publicly one of my professors in class 
when he was in Isaiah chapter 11. And this professor was a post-millennialist. That is to say, Jesus is coming back. The trumpet sounds at the end of the millennium. And these guys were sitting there waiting for Ivan to speak up. And I wanted to. I really did. I'm going to pull all my eschatology out right now, and we're going to go for it. And I sat there, Professor Jack Collins, if you want to know who it is, Jack Collins, Hebrew Old Testament Department. Um, and the Lord convicted me. I mean, you just want to bring eschatology to the fore. And it's like the Lord was talking to me. I couldn't even hear the lecture anymore. It was like the Lord was, not audibly, I've never, it just, it's like, I mean, you turned away from this subject because you got sick of it, and now you're going to talk about it just so that you can gain points with your peers. That's not what eschatology is for. Right? I sat there and remained quiet the entire time. Class was dismissed. We walked out. Four of the guys walked up to me and said, what is wrong with you? You were the only one that could answer that issue in Isaiah chapter 11, when the lions will lie down with lambs. And I said, I just couldn't. Why? And I can't remember what happened. I was just, I was just messed up in my head. And then, you know, the truth is, is that this subject of eschatology is not for fighting. And boy, have I been in a lot of arguments in my life on this subject. Lots. And I don't mind honest, good debate. I don't. I think it's healthy. I think it's good for us. And we can come to different conclusions. That's fine. And love one another. See, it already says love one another. Be ready. Love one another. Didn't say agree with one another. It said love one another. <laughs> but I really do love this subject. And I think now maybe for in the past several years for the right reasons. Because it gives me hope. It gives me encouragement. It's not fodder for an argument. It's the basis for my hope in the Lord to come back and, and clean this mess up. Which is great news. Great news. And the promise that he's going to be with me to the end of the age. Not the beginning of the end of the age. But the end. Because I must endure to the end. All the way. As Jesus said. Well, we will be able to see, fourthly, that Scripture is being fulfilled. Let's read a little bit more. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. But it doesn't come like a thief in the night for everyone, just to those who are lost. Now watch what Paul does with this. While people are saying, there is peace and security... I went back and studied that. You may be familiar with what was called in Latin the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. It's quite possible that this was Roman propaganda in the first century. Roman propaganda. Caesar rules and reigns over the entire known world, and he has instituted his peace and security. Just trust Caesar. Give your allegiance to Caesar, to the government, and I will return to you your peace and your security, your safety. This is exactly what Francis Schaeffer foretold in 1978, that there's a coming in time in this country when everyone is going to want, there will be enough people in this country that will want two things, personal peace and prosperity. Then that was the words he used, or affluence. Personal peace and affluence, or the safety and security. In other words, there will come a time in this country that most Americans will bow down to its Caesar, to its Lord, and give full allegiance. Just keep me safe and provide for me. And I'll, I'll give you everything. This was Roman propaganda in the first century. And so... The Apostle Paul warns, while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness. See, you're not of that group, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. 
for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. And since that's true, so then, let us not sleep. In other words, language to, to describe, let us not be lethargic about this, acting like we don't know what's going on. You should know what's going on because there's enough scripture in there. That goes back to last week, Matthew 24. But let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, that is, died in the Lord, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Hey, folks, the world lives under a delusion that there is no divine wrath coming. That the labor pains aren't coming. He says in 5.8, to put on a shield of faith and love. This is what it means to be ready. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So like a breastplate, we are to be ready by shielding our hearts devoting ourselves to one another, to love each other, and like a helmet, will protect our thinking from the influence of the world's lies. We will keep the helmet on. That is, we will focus our attention on the future hope of salvation, not what the next puppet says on how to be safe and secure in this country. I know where my butter is, my bread is buttered, what side or whatever that phrase is. I think it needs to be very clear. As we keep our eyes open for the things that Jesus has said will take place, when you see the abomination of desolation, he said that, when you see this, at the same time we got our minds from the influence and deception of anyone or anything offering us peace and security. Even if the kingdom of man could prevent disease and pestilence, rising inflation, rising temperatures, rising sea levels, rising blood pressure, there is still no peace and security. He's coming back. He's coming back. The second, second advent, that mountain peak, is on its way. So we encourage one another, we build one another up by reminding one another that Christ is coming back. This is the way that we stay ready for his return. And then quickly, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. He's not finished writing to them about this. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when, here we go, when the Lord, now watch, two things are going to take place here. When the Lord Jesus is revealed, that's another word for parousia, the unveiling, it's not the same word, but it's, it's a synonym. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints. Stop. Full stop. You see where that song came from? It's happening in the same event. Judgment is falling upon the wicked, and the saints are taken off to safety. To be glorified in his saints, and to be marveled at among all who have believed. So when Jesus comes back, two things happen at the same time. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound, righteous meet in the sky. All at once. And to this end, Verse 11, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
in chapter 2, verse 1. Now concerning the coming, there it is, parousia, adventus of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. And that's talking about what he just talked about in verses 7, 8, and 9, and 10. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. That's a synonym. The parousia is the day of the Lord. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. So we're not going to hear the trumpet sound until we see this. The rebellion comes first. The man of lawlessness is revealed during the tribulation. The son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will, be do, will do so until he is out of the way. And folks, we can, we can uh, bark about this until the cows come home, and we'll probably never finally agree on now what is doing the restraining and who is it and what is it and, is it now, and it will be taken out of the way. Is it the Holy Spirit? I don't know. But there's so many good people that disagree on what it is. We just know that God knows what it is. I think he knows. And he's saying, there's come, going to come a day, I'm going to remove it. And then the lawless one will be revealed, verse 8, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his parousia, his advent. He's going to kill him. That's Revelation 19. The, command, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, but not for those who are children of the light, children of the day, will see this. Because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So let's end our time like this. When Jesus returns at the end of the tribulation, at the end of the age, at the seventh trumpet, at the last trumpet, he will both repay the wicked and grant relief to his people. So therefore, number six, what does it mean to be ready? Pray for Christ to be exalted in our lives. Pray for Christ to be exalted in our lives. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers... And there it is. You're not going to miss out on your future resurrection. Jesus promised, all that the Father has given to me will come to me, and I'll lose none of them, and I will raise them all up at the last day. Another way of saying, at the last, all the way at the last. And the reason why is because the people of God will see the final rebellion against God and his people. The man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, the abomination of desolation. There's going to be massive deception upon the earth. The world will hate objective truth on a level that has never been displayed. And God's going to make it worse by binding them even more as condemnation upon them. Folks, the world is headed to a level of denying objective truth like you've never seen before. Jesus said that in Matthew 24. It'll be so powerful that if possible, he says, if possible, to deceive even the elect. But it won't happen. He's just a figure of speech. It's going to be that great. But we are children of the light, and we're going to see all this. The world will more and more take pleasure in unrighteousness. And finally then, we are to be ready by what? Continue to love and believe the truth in God's word. Let us never, ever, ever go the way of the world as it continues more and more and more going down a path of denying objective real truth that men aren't men and women aren't women for example and training first graders to believe that we live in a country where first graders in the public school are being trained to believe that a man is not a man and a woman is not a woman and I can go on we are headed for a level 
of denying objective truth that this world has never seen before. And we'll see it. Because we are children of the day. We are not children of the night. It will not come upon us like a thief in the night. We'll see it all. I don't know when the baby's going to be born, but it is close. We do not know the day nor the hour, but God has given us plenty to look at and keep our eyes open and be ready. So, let's be ready. It's Advent season, right? And I'm sure this will go further past December, huh? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, how it enlightens the eyes, gives us hope, helps us to see the world as you see the world, as you see things, helps to see the, the mountain peaks, as you see the mountain peaks, as time is in between them and where we are in this. Heavenly Father, I confess, and, and I think all of us in here would confess, I have no idea how long it's going to take until the second advent. And people have been saying, just as the Apostle Peter, they were saying, where is he coming? Ah, he's not coming back. It's been 30 years now. It does seem like it's been a long time. But Lord, these times are in your hands, not in ours. And you've given us plenty to stay encouraged. We have plenty in the word to feast upon, to hang our hat on, and to keep loving one another. And to be found ready at the sounding of the trumpet, the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet. And then you will take us away into safety forever and ever and ever. And your wrath will come. Oh Lord, we praise you and thank you that you came once. You advented already. And you promised that you are going to advent again. Thank you for this hope that we have. And it's in your name that we pray.